Welcome to Vegan Business Talk with Katrina Fox, author of Vegan Ventures, Start and Grow an Ethical Business. Hello and welcome to episode 11 of Vegan Business Talk. I'm Katrina Fox, journalist, media trainer and editor of veganbusinessmedia.com, the multimedia blog providing success tips for vegan business owners and entrepreneurs. In this episode, I interview JL Fields, vegan lifestyle coach and educator, food for life instructor, co-creator of real world vegan meal plans, kitchen coach, personal chef, career coach, and corporate consultant offering wellness training, brand representation, and strategic planning services. JL runs the popular blog, JL Goes Vegan, and she's the host of the Easy Vegan with JL Field show on KCMJ, which is Colorado Springs Community Radio. She's the author of the book, Vegan Pressure Cooking, and co-author of Vegan for Her. JL's a graduate of Victoria Moran's Main Street Vegan Academy, and in fact, she's now on the teaching faculty. So she's got a very diverse range of offerings in her business. This is another audio interview that I did for my book, Vegan Ventures, Start and Grow an Ethical Business. Now, JL's story is an inspiring one because she spent many years working in the not-for-profit sector before deciding to make a sea change in middle age. And this is important because we often hear about people starting businesses when they're younger, in their 20s and 30s. And JL's a great example of how it's possible to create a business based on your passions at any age. In this interview, JL talks about how she gets her local media to give her free publicity on a regular basis. The importance of being flexible in your business offerings and utilising skills and contacts you've built up over your professional life. How taking a stand and speaking out about what she believes in helped grow her profile and her business. That's a particularly important one because I think a lot of business owners think, oh, well, I'm in business now. You know, I can't be too political or I can't speak out about this, that or the other. Um, When in fact, um, it's the opposite. And JL's a really good example of that and much more. Here's the interview with JL Fields. In terms of um, running a vegan business, and um, there's a lot of, or one of the the things that some of the the small business owners are are, are saying is that, you know, they've not only got to kind of run their business and be in their business, and there's all the admin and stuff. Now we've got the added extra of, you know, social media um, platforms, and a lot of them can feel a bit of overwhelm. And I'm I'm just kind of interested to get your take on that, on um, how you personally deal with that overwhelm, um, and what advice you might give to, to other business owners. Mm, that's a great question. Well, so, you know, I think it's important to, to make sure, sh- you know, my business is service oriented, right? So it's not like I'm walking into a, a store or a place that has to be open from this time to this time. You know, I'm providing services and that's what my small business is. Um, and so truthfully, social media is why I have a, a, a good business because <laughs> before I started my business, I, you know, I started writing my, my website and then, um, I started to build a social media following. So truthfully, I I think a lot of what I, I, so I enjoy social media. And, um, when I, like today I posted a picture of my vegan cowboy boots that I was wearing and, um, and it actually serves my business. One, the people who follow me, they're like, Oh cool. She has vegan cowboy boots. But for somebody else who's like, I could never go vegan. And they're like, Oh wait, She's wearing vegan cowboy boots. Who is she? And then they click through and they come to my website and then they see that they can get vegan lifestyle coaching from me. So for me, I don't see social media as extra. I see social media as inherently a part of what I do because it's it's how people actually know someone. I just had I just had a networking um, meeting with someone and she said, I've never met someone so transparent because <laughs> I just <laughs> say what I think, you know? And so like, I have real strong opinions, you know, I have, I have opinions that not all vegans are skinny. Social media is great because you get to be who you are and you can be transparent. And so I am of the opinion that vegans are not all skinny, nor do they all have to be skinny in order to be a good vegan. And the reason, you know, I'm, so I'm very opinionated about that. Um, on my website and I have a second blog called stop chasing skinny. But what's great about that is from a business perspective, I've had people reach out to me for individual coaching who say, 
I want to work with you because I know my doctor tells me I need to lose some weight, but you're not going to try to make me skinny. You just want me to be healthy. And wow. so they wouldn't know that if not for social media. They wouldn't know that if I didn't go on a rant on Twitter to say, oh, great, another organization is telling us if we're not skinny, we're not good vegans. And so, you know, so I think social media is so important. Um, and like I said, because I do services, um, I imagine it might be different if I had to go open a store every morning or be there for eight hours or, or whatever other kinds of businesses you're doing. But for me, it's like breathing. It's not, I don't, not only do I not consider it burdensome, I, I find it complimentary to my work. Fantastic. So you're kind of not really having the challenge of overwhelm in terms of things that you do in your business. Awesome. No, that sense. not around social media. No. All right, got it. Cool. Okay, fair enough. That's great. Um, so in terms of um, how much time per week do you spend doing what we call working on your business rather than in it? So rather than, you know, as opposed to just doing the coaching or the speaking or the admin and all that stuff, but actually working on it and, you know, taking that step back and strategizing, coming up with new ways to promote or new, new coming up with new ideas for your business. Hmm. Um, it, will, it would depend upon the week. Um, you know, I, I always tell people I do career, I do career coaching. So for people who are trying to start their own service businesses and I tell people that they should expect in the first year that they will probably be doing 25% of the work that they actually want to do and 75 to 80% of marketing and promoting and thinking and strategizing because a business just really doesn't happen, especially when it's services. Um, you know, I'm, I'm not seeing clients, um, from the time I wake up in the morning till the time I, I go to sleep. I have to spend some time like last night I got home from work and I was thinking, Oh my gosh, I need to think about my class schedule over the next three months. I've been so busy. So I just sat down and I'm like, when will I be here? What do I want to teach? How am I going to reach out to people? And by the end of the evening, I had my calendar set up and I scheduled classes. And then by this morning, I published in them all. And, you know, now my job will be promoting it. And so, I mean, I think that I think this is what I think. I think on the day to day, it's really hard to, to make the time to strategize because too many other things are there's too much noise. Right. Which is why I go to so many conferences and I go to workshops because they give you that space. I mean, sometimes I find that I'll go to a conference where I'm not hearing anything new, but I'm sitting around 200 other people in the same room and we're hearing the same thought. And what I'm doing is I'm thinking about how this applies to my business and like, how can I promote it and how can I get the word out? And so I think that on a day to day basis, it's kind of hard to, to, to prioritize and to schedule that sort of visioning time but that I am really good about scheduling networking and conference time because I know that those will be the slots of time that I get to think more strategically about how I'm moving forward. Fantastic. Yes, you're almost taking yourself away from the business altogether to focus on that. That's cool. That's just, yeah, I like that. It's a great idea. Um, what were the key when? Because um, I know you, you, you've had the, the corporate career still still got that. But when you um, like literally went into the vegan lifestyle coaching, um, I guess that was a fairly you know, new thing. So, what were your major challenges when you um, set that side of your business up? Well, yeah. So actually, um, my my professional career for 25 years, I worked in the nonprofit sector. So I worked for social service agencies and institutions of higher education. So I did a lot of fundraising and, and when I stopped and started my business, it was from scratch. And so, um, I, um, I had was going through Victoria's training and was going to become a vegan lifestyle coach. And I was just sure that as soon as I put it up on my website, I'd been blogging, I guess at the time for maybe three years that I would have all of these clients. And that just did not happen. And so instead what I did was like, okay, well, what, have, what have I figured out that I know, you know, like, how do I like message simple ways to eat vegan? You know, I'm not a trained chef. I'm a home cook. I started to find other ways to do what I wanted to do with individuals. So I started setting up public classes. I started reaching out to companies that might need someone to write some language for them around addressing a plant-based audience. And so all of those things all started kind of coming together 
at the same time. So I'm only, what I'm trying to make the distinction is I wasn't a corporate consultant and then I became a vegan lifestyle coach. That wasn't the case at all. I worked for a college. I'd been working for 25 years for institutions and I quit my job and I started my business and I didn't really know what my business was going to be. And so what I envisioned my business to be was writing, um, coaching, and teaching. And I wanted that really to all be around veganism. But what I also understood was that that wasn't going to happen overnight. And so I got in touch with some companies that were connected to my old world of higher education and fundraising. And I took on small, you know, short term projects with them to consult so that I could make some money while I spent my time building things up. So what's happened now is that I describe my when people say, what do you do? I say, I'm an author and I'm a vegan cook, coach, and consultant. And so I, lucky me, for the last two years, I've been working on a book each year. um, So that's great. Um, And then um, in addition to that, because books don't pay very much money, you probably know that. Um, (laughs) um, They're labors of love. Um, So in addition to that, I get freelance writing work. And now I have corporations that hire me to come in and write plant-based content for them or do plant-based social media for them. Um, I do corporate trainings where I go into an organization and I'll do a six week cooking class with their employees. Um, So that's another revenue model. I do work with individuals um, on vegan lifestyle coaching, kitchen coaching. I make meal vegan meals for families and deliver them. I um, teach public classes. I was trained through the physicians committee for responsible medicine to be a food for life instructor. And the reason I'm saying all of that is because for my business to work, I need all of those revenue streams because if one closes up, which they will, especially when you're working in corporate America, it's very common on October 1st to be told they're not going to use you for the next three months because that's when they're tightening up because they want to look really good for Wall Street on January 1st. So they kind of flush out the meat, right? They get rid of the the vegan meat um, and they get rid of that excess. And then they may or may not bring you back in January. So as a consultant, you have to be ready for all of those things. And so, um, so really with the coaching, you know, when I put my um, sort of sign up on my website, I'm a coach and no one, you know, crickets. I didn't hear from anybody. The thing (laughs) I did was I was being interviewed. um, I relocated from New York to Colorado and um, was new in town and had met um, the food editor of our local paper in Colorado Springs. And she was writing a story on veganism. So she interviewed me and I realized that this was like in February of 2013 and my book was, my first book was coming out in July. And I thought, well, that's going to be really boring. Like at the end, it's going to say, and her book is coming out in July. And I'm like, what what are we going to do with all of those months in between? So I took this model that I had prepared on how I would coach people, the kinds of steps I would take them through. And I took those modules and turned them into a series of three classes And so I followed up with the reporter and I said, I can't believe I forgot to tell you I'm teaching this class series in March and this is what it's called. Well, she ran that and my class is sold out. And that's when I started doing classes. Well, once I started doing classes where I didn't make a whole lot of money, but I made some money, then people started hiring me as a coach. And so I started to look at my classes as really a marketing tool to then really do that individualized work with people. So that's how I started to build that side of the practice was going out, networking with people, teaching classes where I didn't charge a lot of money, but I gave a lot of value and content and that would inspire people to want to hire me to work with them individually. Yeah, that's great. So what I'm hearing is quite a lot of diversification. Yeah. Uh, you're going to be prepared, particularly if you're in a cert or you're starting up um, within the service industry as a small business owner to yeah, not be so focused on just doing this and that's it, but to be a bit more flexible. So I love that. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that with me. Um, so in terms of um, standing out, like, you know how, um, you know, we're full of, again, on social media, there's lots of, you know, we're getting um, messages, pop ups, you know, emails and all the rest of it. How do you go about um, sort of standing out in that world and getting in front of people without seeming like you're harassing them? Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, no, it's a good question. You know, I don't do email lists. Um, everyone says I should and I don't. Um, I tried it and just I'm like, I'm already blogging. I'm already doing all of this stuff. I don't have the time for it. Um, what I always say to people is, um, often authenticity almost always wins. And what I mean by that is, um, 
You know, so I have a website and it's not a big website. I don't have a huge readership. I have a consistent one. Um, I have pretty good social media um, as far as followers go. But what I do is I just write about what I know and what I'm passionate about. And so far it has um, served me well, meaning um, my first book and, and and the reason I keep referring to books is because the books are actually what has helped me catapult my business um, in the sense of it's given me street cred, right? Like people are like, oh, well, she has a book. Um, but the way that first book happened was I went to a conference called Vita VitaCon, which is a vegan blogging conference. It's in the U.S., um, but there, I think we had several people from Australia there. Um, and I met Jenny Messina, who writes the website The Vegan RD, and she's an author. Um, she's a, a registered dietitian. And I met her, and a few months later, she asked me to collaborate with her on the book Vegan for Her. And she wanted me to write the cookbook section. And I said, Jenny, I'm not a trained chef. Like I don't even take pretty pictures of food. I'm not. And she said, you know what? That's why I want you. She said, your recipes are good. They're wholesome. They're, they're decadent on occasion. And what I want is for people to pick up this book and think I can cook this way. And so I was rewarded for just writing simple old home cook recipes with not really with very fancy photos. Um, a year later, I got an email from a publisher, Fairwinds, and they said, we have been very interested in putting out a book called Vegan Pressure Cooking, and we found your website, and you do this. Would you be interested? And that's my next book that's coming out in January. But the point is, I don't feel like I am putting myself out there that much. What I'm doing is just consistently being truthful about what I know. I, I mean, I became obsessed with my pressure cooker. I think it's the coolest thing in the world. I'm cuckoo <laughs> for it. And everyone gets that. They're like, oh my God, she's crazy for this thing. And it rewarded <laughs> me. I got a book and now I get cooking demos from that, you know, and I get invited to veg fest. And when I go to a veg fest, then I meet a vendor who's selling a product. And then it turns out that that's the owner of the company. And he says, oh, hey, will you work for me and help with, and then it all starts to tie together. So I got a book. I went to a veg fest and did a cooking demo for 200 people. I met someone who owned a vegan burger company and suddenly now I'm repping him, you know, so all of these things just kind of happen. And so it wasn't like putting myself out there, but it was um, doing what I know and what I feel comfortable with and not trying to be something that I'm not. Right. Does that make sense? Doing- yeah, it does. And I guess it's like not doing that hard sell. Like it sounds like you've not been going right by this, buy my thing, buy my thing all the time. It's more just, yeah, you're putting stuff out there and people are attracted to you because of that. And then they kind of naturally would buy from you or the ones that are, that feel right about it. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. That's, that's great. Attraction versus devotion. But without, I mean, I'm, I'm not being naive. I have to promote myself. Like I would say that probably on any given week on my Facebook page, I'm mostly sharing interesting things I find. Um, but then it's interspersed with my latest blog post or, Hey, did you know I've got a class starting in November, but that's not the majority of what I put out there. The majority of what I put out there are, are things that excite me or that I read about that I want to share with people. And of course I promote my things too, but promotion isn't that's secondary promotion. Yeah. Secondary. Got it. Got it. In terms of competition, because now I guess there's more and more vegan lifestyle coaches um, coming through um, Victoria's Academy and there's a lot of vegan authors and, and cookbooks and, and all the rest of it. So um, how do you go about sort of maintaining, uh, you know, that that profile, if you like, within the now kind of almost burgeoning sort of vegan lifestyle um, businesses and services that are available? I think um, I'll go back to authenticity um, about writing and doing what you're good at and what you are skilled at. Um, but I'd also say that I think that when, when, when I hear the word competition, what I go to is collaboration. And oh, that was my next question. That's great. So, okay. <laughs> so this is very funny. So last May at Victoria's training, I'm on Victoria's faculty now. So I go to New York four or five times a year and I teach in her faculty or er, her academy. Last May, there were three people from Colorado Springs going through the training <laughs> and I live in Colorado Springs. So I was the only vegan lifestyle coach and now I'm going to train three other people. And you know what I did? First off, I used that as an example when I was tr- training the entire academy, there were 15 people in there and I said, some of you might think you're going back and you're going to be competitive with people. I'm training three people right in front of me right now who are going to back to my town. And you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to ask them, what is your focus going to be? What are you really good at? How do you want to work with people? What do you want to do? What do you want to do? Here's what I want to do. How do we message this? And then you know what I did at the end of the training? The four of us got up. 
we put Victoria right here and I had someone take a photo of us. And then I asked each of them, I said, send me your bio, send me your website and tell me what your coaching philosophy is. And one of them was around the environment. One of them was around um, sort of mind body wellness because she's a psychotherapist. The other one, he's an athlete. And then mine is around home cooking. I sent out a press release to my local paper, sent that photo and sent the bios and all of us. And I said, how lucky are we? Colorado Springs now has four vegan lifestyle coaches. Okay. Meet them. And then des- described who each of them was. And you know what happens when you build that collaboration? It's really hard to look at one as one another as competitors. Instead, if someone came to me and said, I want vegan lifestyle coaching, I want to do an Iron Man, and I want to learn how to cook, I'd be like, dude, you need to talk to Matt because Matt's an Iron Man. I'm not. You know, or, you know, I'm trying to figure out how this fits with my faith. Talk to Ashley or I'm trying to reduce my carbon footprint. Talk to Sarah. I don't know about that. Oh, you want to make meals with five ingredients or less? I'm your girl. You know, so it's like really knowing what your competition forces you to be honest with yourself about what you're actually good at. I think what happens a lot of times is people think they need to do everything. Like, pick me, pick me. I can do all of these things. Well, can you really, or can you do all of them sort of? And can you do two things great? Why not just focus on the things that you're great at and meet the other person who's great at two things you're not great at, and you become collaborators and not competitors? Nice. I love that. Beautiful. I love that. As I've said, that they find running their own business or starting and running their own business the biggest form of self-development or personal development because it forces you to grow as a person and, you know, sort of dig deep into resources you might not even know you had. Would you agree? Like, what's your perspective on, on that? Oh, I totally agree. I tell you, I so I'm 49 years old. I started my business at 45. So I did everything right, meaning I went to You know, I finished high school, I went to college, I got my master's degree and I started working and I did, and I worked for organizations for 25 years. And when I started my business, it was terrifying. I was like, you know, do I even know what I'm doing? And what I learned was I'm actually really entrepreneurial. I had no idea. And I didn't know that I like had a, you know, it didn't take me long, I guess, you know, you learn things the hard way. Like the first time I did a class, I was like, oh my gosh, I had my class. It was great. And then I was ready to plan my next one. And I put a spreadsheet together and I started tracking how many hours I spent planning the class, um, how much money I spent making copies of handouts or recipes, if I bought food, all of these things. And then what I discovered was at the end of my class, I made $3.33 an hour. <laughs> and I'm like, well, that's not sustainable. Um, and so, but what it helped me from the, the business perspective was like, well, sometimes that might be okay. If I teach a class and only make $3 an hour, but 15 people went through it and, and now I've got my established curricula because, you know, designing is one thing and now I can do it in my sleep, right? I just need to show up and do it. But if that translates into two clients that hire me for multiple sessions, It's marketing money. It's totally worth it. And so I didn't know I had that kind of brain. I didn't know I could think like that. And and so, yeah, um, and I I, I can't imagine working for somebody else again because I really like the independence. I like being nimble. I like um, if someone comes to me and says, can you do this for me? And I can say, well, you know what? I got to be honest with you. I've never done that before. I think I could. But since I haven't done it, I'm not going to charge you as much as I would normally charge. I want you to be flexible with me and understand I might make some mistakes and let's see how this goes. Well, then suddenly I'm doing something I never knew I could do before. And so this whole entrepreneurial way, it's, it's, I, I find it invigorating because I think a lot of people my age going, you know, 50 and then we'll be going 60 kind of think they're coming to the end of their professional career. And I feel like I've just started a whole new way of thinking that's going to keep me thriving and excited for, you know, 20 or 30 more years. And so it's been really liberating. Fantastic. What would you say are the essential qualities that one needs to be able to to, to run and sustain your own business? You've mentioned well, having an uh, entrepreneurial. Um, there are other qualities that you think are necessary to stay the course and uh, grow. Yeah. You know, so before we get to qualities, can I just be kind of pragmatic? Um This is what I've learned. And this is what I tell anybody that I do, that I take on for career coaching. You have to know how much money you want to make. 
And I don't mean that like, I want to be a millionaire kind of way. I mean, like literally how much money do you need to make in order to pay your rent or your mortgage to buy groceries, to put gas in your car? How much money do you need to make? Once you know, then you are forced to be entrepreneurial because you have a bottom line. You know how much money you need to make. I think a lot of people who start businesses or especially like services like me, like maybe they don't really need to work or um, they're retired and this is something they want to do on the side. They'll just kind of like go around and they'll try different things and they may not really sh be sure if they're successful or not. I think when you determine how much money you want to make and how you will define success, then you find out if you've got the chops. Can you really make this happen? Can you go out and hustle, hustle, hustle? Can you make sure that you make $20,000 doing consulting and $20,000 doing coaching and $10,000 doing writing. When you have a goal, it forces you to get out there. And to do that, you need to, in my humble opinion, you need to be a master of networking. And networking doesn't mean being an extrovert. Net networking means showing up. It means showing up places where people who could either use your services or connect you to people who use your services, um, that you show up there. Um, so you don't have to be an extrovert to be a networker, but you have to show up places and then you have to hustle and you have to be willing to tell people what you do. You, you, you know, I like in having a small business to running a nonprofit. I served as executive director of three nonprofits and the only way I got feedback on how I was doing was when I told my board of directors how I was doing because I was the bottom line boss. No one else knew how I was doing. So I would say to the board of directors, I want you to know that we got three new sources of funding, that we have 25 new clients or whatever it is. I was my advocate and it's no different when you're running a small business. So you just have to consider the public, your board of directors. You have to tell them how awesome you are because there's no other way they're going to know it. And so I think you do have to kind of get rid of this idea of being, being humble is wonderful. Um, but being humble doesn't mean that you also don't tell people how great you are. And you just have to find that place of how comfortable you are or how you tell your, your narrative of, of what you're capable of doing. And so I do think now like, you know, to like skills or capabilities, it is being able to quantify what you do, tell people what you do. And make sure that other people are so convinced that you do it well that they're willing to tell other people. And I think it requires hustle. It requires, um, you know, a sense of pride and a willingness to tell people how smart you are and how good you are. Excellent. I love that. Brilliant. Brilliant. What specific steps or strategies or techniques do you use um, in terms of mindset, um, you know, in terms of kind of managing, I guess, your own kind of uh, emotional and mental well-being? In running your business so that might be getting coaching yourself or meditation or anything like that well again I'm gonna go back to this pragmatic side of me you know what was really important for me was um, most of us who start our own businesses especially if it's service oriented um, we probably work from a home office and that didn't work for me so I found um, a space in town is called a co-working space so people oh, yeah are members and it's an open space where people come and they can sit down and open up their laptop and have access to Wi-Fi. But what happens is you're sitting around all these other people who don't do anything else like you do, but you hear them working, you hear them on the phone, you see them strategizing on the whiteboard and it, I find it invigorating. And so I think um, the other thing that helped though was that then I left someplace at the end of the day and came home. Cause I think a lot of times when we have our own business, we don't stop. It's 24 seven. It's like from the minute we wake up to the minute we go to bed, we're thinking about our business. So if you find a way to extricate yourself from that and give yourself time to be a volunteer in the community, give yourself time to be a husband or a wife or a partner um, or a daughter or a mother, um, that that only makes us better business people. But if we're only focused in, you know, on the business, we're going to get stale or we're going to not, we're going to have blinders on and we're not going to become objective. And that, you know, so you mentioned meditation. I think that's great. I'm a Buddhist. I'd like to say I meditate. I don't. Um, I'd like to say I do yoga. I don't. Um, I'm in the world of Colorado. We hike and I do find getting outside really kind of liberates my brain. But I really think it is. When you become self-employed, self-employed doesn't mean working 24-7. In fact, I think it's the opposite. I tell people when they want to start their own business, and I say to them, if you at the end of the day said, oh, my God, I hate my job, or I had a horrible day, 
then you might not be doing it right. You know, so like, what's the pro like, like, you know, I started my business for a reason. It was because I wanted to have some freedom and some flexibility. And I wanted to work towards issues that were really passionate and important to me, which is veganism. Um, and specifically not just veganism in the sense of being thin or low cholesterol. I mean, like I want my work to have an impact on animals not being harmed. You know, that's how I operate on a daily basis. And, um, and I can't, but I can't do that 24 seven. I have to be able to find that, you know, I have to pull back so that I can come back and, and, and do good. So I think that, um, you know, you're doing well, if you can say, okay, I had a stressful day. Stress is different than hating your job. <laughs> we all have some level of stress, but yeah. like if you, a client that you, you know, then, then you learn from that, like get up, like end that relationship as soon as possible and never work with that client again, you know, and, and be willing to learn from that. But you have to be able to step back and look at what you're doing. And it's like, is, am I just working all the time or have I found a way to do my work really, really well and to have my life and to live my life? Yeah, that's a really important one. I think particularly for people who are running their businesses, like you say, because their why is around making a difference. Sometimes there's almost that bit of guilt of, oh, my God, I'm, I'm out here in the sun enjoying myself. I, I should be doing this. I should be doing that sort of things. So I think that's really important. So thank you for uh, for sharing that. That's fantastic. And what have been the key lessons that you've learned through running your, your vegan lifestyle business, either about yourself um, or personally or professionally or both even? I think it's very easy when you work um, with a vegan focus or in the vegan community or with the vegan mission to assume that everyone thinks like you do and that it's really important to remember that actually, well, I mean, listen, if I have a vegan clothing store or a vegan grocery store, there are probably people who are walking in specifically because that's what they're looking for. But services are different. Um, and so I remember the first class I taught where when I walked in, I'm like, oh my gosh, all these people want to be vegan. That's why they signed up for the class. It's called Beyond Meatless Monday. It's about changing your diet, changing your home, changing you. And they made it clear in that first class, we're not here to be vegan. One person said, my doctor says my cholesterol is high and I should be eating more plants. Or another person said, my husband has cancer. I'm trying to change the diet but we're not here to be vegan. And it was like, Oh my gosh, this is so weird. But <laughs> it was really important because if we're preaching to the people who already are, I mean, I, I didn't become a vegan lifestyle coach to work with vegans. I became a vegan lifestyle coach and I do corporate consulting. Um, and I do my writing to reach people who never considered being vegan. Um, and I want to invite them in. I don't want to force them in or to argue them in or to like hate them in. I want them to see a happy, healthy lifestyle that's fun and delicious and compassionate. And so the key lesson for me is to not assume that everyone thinks that I think that, that, that everyone thinks the way I think. In fact, I need to assume that they don't and that I need to then approach them in the way that I would have wanted to be approached before I was vegan, which is I'm not there yet. So how can I do that in a kind and compassionate way? And I think for me, that has helped with everything, my writing, my corporate consulting, and my coaching is that I don't make assumptions and I don't feel like a failure if at the end of it, they didn't become vegan. Um, if, if someone went through one of my classes or worked with me for three months and they're eating fewer animals, I win. Nice. You know? So, I mean, that's, that, that's, yeah. that's my approach. Okay. I love that. And you mentioned as a, uh, someone who uh, does career coaching, what do you think are some of the mistakes that aspiring business owners make um, when, you know, they're jumping from employed to setting up their own business? Because it's quite a jump. So what do they need to take into account? and What are some of the mistakes they make? I think the biggest mistakes are no goals um, and, that, and essentially no business plan. Um, that I think a lot of people, especially in the vegan world, they kind of romanticize, like, I'm going to be a vegan chef. I'm going to be a personal home cook. I'm going to be a coach. Well, if everyone wanted that, then we'd have more than 5% of the world being vegan, right? So, I mean, we already have a big obstacle, which is most people are like, man, don't touch my meat. Like, I don't want to hear about it. I don't, you know, like, because I don't want you to touch what, what I eat. And so um, I think that if people realistically look at... Um, Set a, a business plan that's attainable 
is really important. So I think a, a number one mistake is not having a plan. I think the second thing is that people try to sometimes be something that they're not. And what I mean by that is all of the things that I'm doing now, I did before, but now I do them with the vegan focus. And so when some people say, I want to do exactly what you do, I say, well, that's probably impossible because I have a totally different set of experiences than you've had. But these are the things that I had done for 25 years. I did strategic planning for organizations. I led organizations. I did fundraising. I taught and I wrote, but I wrote grants. I taught about nonprofit governance. I raised money for nonprofit, um, you know, events. And so, but those skills transferred. So now I write, but I don't write grants anymore. I write cookbooks or I write web content. I don't teach about governance anymore. I teach about how at the age of 45, I taught myself how to cook vegan. Um, I, you know, do strategic planning, but not for nonprofits any longer. Now I work for brands who are like, okay, in the next year, how can I increase the number of vegans who use my product and how do I reach them? So I didn't invent new skills. These were skills I had that I was good at. And that I enjoyed and I transferred them into a vegan business. And I, and so when I work with my clients, the very first session is always focusing on what are you good at? What are you experienced at? And what do you want to do on a day to day basis? Once we've identified those, what they came in thinking their business was going to be might end up looking very, very different because it's like, okay, so you don't really like talking to people. Then why are you going to be out in a restaurant? <laughs> So what can you do in which you don't have to talk about to people, but you can still do it because you're good at it and you can still have an impact. So I think that you, so I think the second, second obstacle is trying to be something that we're not, which isn't to say we can't change because then that goes into the third thing. I think people limit themselves. Um, okay. This is good. So I'm going to keep remembering what I said. So the first one is no business plan. The second one is um, that people don't focus on the skills and abilities they already have and translate them. And third, is that people sometimes think, well, I can't do that because I don't know how. And what I always tell people is become a student of your hobbies. And so if you love cooking, but you were never really good at it, take some cooking classes. If you love writing around about food, but all you can think of are delicious and yummy, those words aren't going to fly. Take a writing class. And so maybe you aren't a great writer right now, but you could become one. Maybe you aren't a great cook right now, but you could become one. And so don't let what you aren't be the thing that keeps you from what you could be. But don't feel like, but don't pretend if you're not that person, like start taking classes, be it, be in a, a lifelong learner, you know, and, and start to explore. And then you also might find things that you hate. Like I took culinary classes and I thought, you know what, if I have to stand on my feet eight hours a day and cook, I will be in hell. So don't do that. <laughs> You know, and so that helps you kind of identify back to that other point of what are you good at and what do you enjoy doing? So I think, you know, so I would just say the obstacles are no business plan, not being clear on what your own skills and abilities are and not giving yourself the opportunity to learn new skills and abilities. I think that if you break through those barriers, you've really opened up the opportunity to be a very sort of um, strategic and broad thinking entrepreneur. Brilliant, brilliant. Just on marketing and branding and the use of the term vegan. So I know you've got JL Goes Vegan. You've also got JL Feels Consulting, I think. So I'm just curious around the, the, the use of the word vegan for vegan businesses, because some say, oh, look, it scares people off. And the other argument is it's very clever niching. Um, so I'm just curious. I know we kind of touched on that a little bit, but how do you kind of find that the fact that, you know, you are vegan and you've got this JL vegan, particularly in the corporate field and others, how does that kind of fly? How do you, how do you sort of balance those two out? So that you you do have business and you're not terrifying people. I'm just yeah. curious to get your take on that. No, it's a really great question. It's funny when I started my um, consulting. So I my website was called Jo Goes Vegan, and that was my blog, right? So I was just being clever. So after I finished um, the vegan lifestyle coaching, and I'm like, okay, well my site is called Jo Goes Vegan. Now I'm a coach. How about Go Vegan with Jl? Because they kind of make sense. So I bought the domain. And it feeds into my website. And someone said to me, you know, that's nice, but it's a little, you know, it might push people off. And I said, well, here's the thing. I'm actually an ethical vegan and I want people to know what they're getting into. And so I don't call myself plant strong. I'm not plant powered. I, I'm not putting it down. I'm just saying that's not me. Yeah. I'm a vegan. You need to know what you're getting, you know. And so so for me, that was very intentional. But the JL Fields Consulting 
you know, when, like I said, when I started my business, I needed to make some money doing what I had been doing before. So I thought, you know what, I'm going to have my umbrella. And that's what my legal business name is, is JL Fields Consulting. So the, the, the IRS, the U.S. government knows me as that. And Go Vegan with JL and all those other things are programs under this umbrella. But when you go to my website, you clearly will see a block that says vegan cook coach consulting. And so I'm never hiding who I am, but I need people to come to me from different ways. And so, um, so an example, I'm now trained through PCRM to be a food for life instructor. Well, when we went through that training, they actually said here, vegan is not a noun. So what they meant was they don't want me to stand up and say I'm vegan. They want us to talk about plants. And so as a ethical vegan, I'm like, <sighs> but, but I got it because, you know, they have a very strategic approach, which is they want people who have diabetes or at risk of diabetes to start eating plants and save themselves. They want people who are at risk for cancer. So I got that. So here's what I did. I bought a domain called FFL, Food for Life, Colorado Springs dot com. It goes into jail goes vegan. So I can hand out a business card and it says food for life says my name, gives a website, but they're still going to know what they get. So my point is no matter how I, so I have to think strategically, like when I'm meeting someone, what card is going to be the thing that invites them to continue a conversation with me. But when they get it, they're still going to find out who I am, but I might've softened the blow a little bit or whatever. But, but from the vegan lifestyle coaching, I never, I never considered not calling myself straight out vegan because there are lots of people, like if someone wants to be plant strong, um, there are other people who will work with them and that's great. You know, like, you know, so it, it's like, it, it just goes back to the niche we were talking about. You know, we're, there's so many of us. Um, and so I don't worry about the term. I'm conscious of the term because I don't want it to alienate people. Um, but I don't hide from it. So I make sure that no matter how people meet me, they'll find out what I'm really about. Got it. Nice. I like that. You mentioned that you'd sent a press release earlier, which is very ingenious. So you obviously uh, see the value of a news media as a part of your PR strategy. Tell me a little bit about, more about that. So that's one great example that you shared earlier. Have you had any other uh, success and experience in, in, in getting that? Yeah. You know, it's funny. On, um, on We have a private Facebook page, group for uh, Victoria's alumni. And I'll always, I'll share stories that get written and I, I have a hashtag and my hashtag is local media matters because we all get so caught up in the website, in the Twitter handle, in the this or the that. But if you're doing something super, super micro in your tiny little town, it doesn't matter that you have 14,000 followers on Twitter. Who knows you in Colorado Springs? You know how they know me? Through the media. So I send out press releases for everything. And I don't get everything covered, but you know what does happen? I send out these press releases and then I get an email from the editor of our local independent paper that says, hey, we're doing our 2014 things to do in Colorado Springs. Can we hire you to write an article on what to do in Colorado Springs if you're a vegan? So I keep sending those press releases out and then I get a freelance gig out of it. I send those press releases out and then... Teresa Farney, who's the food editor of our daily newspaper, a very conservative daily newspaper called the Gazette, quotes me when she's writing about ancient grains. And she writes, I talk about why grains are important on a vegan diet. And so those press releases often get me used as a resource and a source, not promoting necessarily what I do. And, um, and then truthfully, I now am, I write a monthly dining review for that very conservative daily newspaper. I write a once a month vegan restaurant review. So nice. they brought me on because I send press releases out all the time. And then my PCRM training, I'm doing my first cancer prevention class and I send out press releases. And last week, the Gazette did a huge story on it and the Colorado Springs Business Journal did a story on it. And this goes out to employers. And so I know that I keep, you know, I'm able to do my classes and then I keep getting hired to do things because I let the local press know who I am and what I'm about and what I know. It's, it's essential. And you do that yourself, which yes. is great. So you're not needing to yeah, spend it's money so on it. so simple. Here. People think it's so complicated. I have one template for a press release and it says the date, the contact, and then I just changed the title. I changed the three paragraphs in the middle and I have my about section and I have the same list of people I send it out to every time. And I do calendar listings. I, I go to my two newspapers 
online. And anytime I'm having a class, I just, you can list them for free. And you know what? I have people who show up and I say, Oh, I don't have you on the RSVP list. And they said, Oh, I saw it in the Gazette yesterday. I great. Perfect. That's it. You know, absolutely. That's great. What about social media? So I know you actually, you've kind of touched on this actually already. So for you, is it which particular social media platforms are you most active on and that you find more, most successful for your business? My biggest following and my probably my biggest engagement is Twitter and Facebook. Um, I have almost 14,000 followers on Twitter now, um, which are pretty engaged. You know, I mean, Twitter, you know, you get a lot of people who don't really know who they are, but, um, and Facebook, you know, so I don't have huge, like, I think I have like maybe 6,700 fans on my Facebook page, but I was just looking at it last night and, you know, I've only lived in Colorado for two years, but my, um, my biggest city is Colorado Springs as far as my followers. So I was able, because I make a point to tag it. Like I'll, if it, if it's something about Colorado Springs, I'll say, Hey, Colorado Springs vegans, check this out. And then that gets shared. And I do, I do, um, boost I, I do pay to boost some of my ads like so if i have a class coming up i'll do like the 30 dollars and i'll target you know 25 mile radius of colorado springs and um i think that's helped my reach and so i don't really know if social media helps me as far as like put butts in the seat for a class but it does help with me being a known presence and i think ultimately that helps down the road yeah, so it's the brand building and awareness, engaging with brands. Yeah, for sure. Great. So final two questions. Um, oh, actually, you don't do that. You, I just remember you said you don't send email lists out, mm. do you? So you don't use, okay, that's that one done then. What other technology tools or apps do you find essential in running your business? Mm. Um, well, my website is my platform. You know, I have a WordPress blog that I've kind of turned into. I consider it my portfolio now. I tell people... Um, someone in a, in a, a small, I'm in a, a part of a small group of women who are vegan business women. They're like eight of us. And we just kind of, you know, email each other for advice. And someone said, how are you promoting your blog post? And I said, you know what, honestly, I kind of quit promoting my blog post. My blog is never going to be really big, but it's my online portfolio. So when someone Googles something like yeah. vegan Colorado Springs, I'm going to come up. So, you know, for me, um, blogging is an important tool. Um, Something we haven't talked about, and so it's not really a tool, but I think it's something that's important, is um, I am now the lead organizer of the Colorado Springs Vegan and Ve Vegetarian Meetup. And so um, what's happened is when I took it over, we had about 400 members, and now we're almost, we're we're almost at 700. We're, we're 10 away from 700 members. And so um, I coordinate a lot of volunteer activities. But then I also promote my own business on that. And so that is, that's an app because there's an app for meetup on the iPhone. And so I, I really stay in touch with what's happening um, with meetups because that builds local macro community, you know, or I mean, sorry, micro community. So I think yeah. that's important. Um, I'm just trying to think from, you know, I always say that I've never, there's, I've never met a spreadsheet that I didn't love. Like I need to know. <laughs> That's a great quote. <laughs> it's true. I just love it for everything. Packing, vacation. <laughs> but you know what? Spreadsheets keep me honest with myself. Like I don't say, oh, my God, that class was such a huge success. Look at all these people that came. I always have to look at what did I spend? How much time did I spend? And it keeps me honest and focused, and it makes me – it inspires me to get out and get more people there so that my time is worth it when I'm spending – time putting a class together or doing a corporate training or doing social media for a client. And so I think um, any kind of application that will help people be organized and be truthful. Oh, timecamp.com. Um, I'm not promoting them. I don't even know them. I pay $10 a month for a program called timecamp.com. And that's how I track all of my time on my projects. You can, you can put like a client and then you could put six different things you do for a client um, or when, when I have a consulting client, an individual, I put that person's name and then I put, um, I categorize sub projects like, um, advanced prep work or time on the phone with them, time that I was emailing with them, time that I put summaries together or meal plans together, because I want to know how much time. So if I tell you that our hour together is going to cost $65 an hour, so one person might say, Oh, she makes $65 an hour. Uh, uh. Because before we even got on the phone, you sent me 
a list of what you want to work on. I looked at that. I came up with an agenda. So I probably spent 40 minutes on it. Then I was on the phone with you. And then you identified three areas in which you needed resources. So when we got off the phone, I researched those areas. I put those resources together and I emailed you and I sent it to you. So now I probably spent three hours with you. So I didn't make $65 an hour. So that's fine, but you just have to know that. And so Time Camp is a great tool or any kind of time management program where you're logging your time, not just the actual doing time, but everything else yeah. around it. So you can start to put reasonable prices and rates around what it is that you do, because I think we fool ourselves on how much time we think we spend an hour and a half doing something and we don't. We spent four hours doing it. I love that. That's brilliant. J.O., you've been very, very generous with your insights and the time. Is there anything else you'd like to say? I know the question's been pretty extensive. So, <laughs> questions, and I can't wait to read your book. You know, I would just, you know, my final parting word for anyone is, you know, when I started this um, business, and, and luckily my husband started his own business at the same time. He's a triathlon coach. And really what we, what happened was we knew that we'd be working into our 70s. And so we tried to imagine, we were like, well, would we want to be doing the work we're doing right now when we're 70? And the answer was no, that was depressing. So instead of getting depressed, what we asked ourselves is what would we be doing when we were 70? And what he said was, I'd be coaching athletes. I would be, you know, I'd have a swim club. I would be talking to people about how to, you know, new people who want to become triathletes, I'd be coaching them. And I said, well, I'd be teaching people how to cook and I could, I'd love to be a writer. And then we were like, then why aren't we doing that right now? And so we came up with a plan and it started with how much money do we need to make? Do we need to change our budget and change the way we live to bring that amount down so that we don't have to kill ourselves when we start our business? And then it helped us become focused on what is our plan and how much money do we need to make? And so all of that was connected to what we call professionalizing our passion. We just were like, okay, these are things we're passionate about. Let's find a way to incorporate them into our profession. And I think that it's possible for a lot of people. I understand there's a lot of privilege around that too, you know? And so, I mean, there are people who are, you know, they're single mothers who are working three jobs and they're like, yeah, I wish lady. And so I'm not, you know, I'm not in la la land. I get that it's not for everybody, but if you have that opportunity, why wouldn't you take it? Why wouldn't you explore that and, and, and see if you could make that work? And it doesn't necessarily have to mean being a business owner. It could be you're a brilliant graphic artist and you want to devote your life to changing the world for animals, then maybe you can start to change your graphic art design from working with Nike to working with, you know, a farmed animal sanctuary. So I think there are lots of ways for us to tap into what we know and then and use it to fuel what we're passionate about. Just on that, when you've started up, so do you think it's important for, for business owners to have some kind of capital to get their business going, whether that's, you know, they've left a job and they've got a bit of a nest egg saved up or, do you, you know, getting investors in or, you know, what I mean, some way of, of actually, you know, having a certain amount of capital. Because some business owners I've spoke to said that, that was their difficult, most difficult challenge in the beginning was they either they had a little bit of money, but they didn't have enough or they didn't realize it would go so quickly or that they just didn't have any and they had to kind of bootstrap. Yeah. yeah, that's a great question. I mean, I think that investors are going to be important for a product um, or something where they're actually going to get a return. Services, they're not going to get a return. I could have never gotten investors to do what I'm doing, right? So, um, so that's why I actually really like when I when I described when I started, I still did some consulting on the fundraising side of things. So I just didn't work for somebody else. I, I got that what I called an anchor client on what I used to do so that I could build my practice on the other side. But I work with a lot of people who have full time jobs and I think they've romanticized the idea of working with other people and helping them go vegan and think that that could be a full time job. Listen, my full time job is not coaching. It's not. I wouldn't survive. Like I had to find other ways that I, and other things I was passionate about around veganism that could make all of this work. And so for a lot of people, what I would simply suggest is if there's something that you really feel like I could make a go of this first off, become good at it. And that means like taking classes at night or taking classes on the weekend and learn how to be that chef or learn how to be a coach. And then see if you can get some clients and start working with them. And once you start to get enough clients where you could see that happening, then you could start to t make some moves. You know, I have a friend right now who he would love to do what I do, but he also has a really good job. And I'm like, why don't you go to them and ask them if you can work part time? I mean, the worst they can do is say no. But if they say yes, then one, your salary was just 
reduced by 50%. So you need to get out there and hustle and make the other part work, but you still have a cushion, you know? And so I think that, um, whatever it is, I mean, Dave and I, we didn't even really have a serious savings plan, but at the time that I started my business, he was still gainfully employed full-time work in New York. And so he was doing that and I started my business and I was able to get a client and then he was able to leave his job. But I had a big client that could cover things for a while. And, you know, and then he has, um, you know, he was in corporate America. So he had, um, you know, compensation when he left. And so you just have to think about what's your reality and like, and, and I think being realistic, like, would you be able to still live the life you're living six months from now? And if the answer is no, don't rush into it. You know, mm-hmm. like, what do you, you know, because you got to, you got to, you're not going to be good for anybody if you don't have a roof over your head and you're not eating. Right. So I think yeah. that you you want to go in with a plan, but it doesn't necessarily mean huge investors. And it doesn't also doesn't necessarily mean a huge savings plan, but it definitely means a reality check. Like, you know, are you really thinking this through? Like if the worst case scenario happens where no one hired you, how long could you live without bringing any money in? And if the answer is, I couldn't go one month, then that's probably not the time to start a business. So that was J.L. Fields, vegan lifestyle coach, consultant, and author. You can find out more about J.L. at jlgoesvegan.com. And that link is on the show notes page at veganbusinessmedia.com forward slash podcasts. Now for our vegan business news roundup. So the big news this week is the launch of the Plant-Based Foods Association. This is a new trade body that represents the interests of the makers of protein made from non-meat sources. The launch was announced in the New York Times. It's founded by lawyer Michelle Simon, and the association already has on board 23 companies, including big players such as Tofurky and well-known names including Miyoko Shinner from Miyoko's Kitchen. Also, Elizabeth Kucinich, wife of the former congressman and presidential candidate Dennis Kucinich, will represent the Plant-Based Foods Association in Washington. So this is really, really exciting news. As the New York Times noted, the trade associations representing the animal agriculture industries wield a lot of power in Washington. Now they've got company and it's major progress. And I'm, I'm so delighted to know that vegan voices are finally getting a seat at the table. So we'll very much be watching watching this one with interest. Holy Vegan Kitchen and Bar is set to open in Florida. What a clever name that is. It's spelled Holy H-O-L-I. I really love the play on words. According to the New Miami Times, the eatery is owned by two vegan couples and will offer fast casual food that will take a holistic approach, of course, and nourish the body, mind and soul, serving breakfast, lunch and dinner. While they're kicking off this first spot in North Miami, the aim is to open branches in other cities. Now, talking of eateries open in other cities, the hugely successful and popular New York restaurant by Chloe is opening in L.A., reports L.A. Eater. Chef Chloe Coscarelli's offerings will soon be available in 365 by Whole Foods Grocery Store Concept, which is a scaled down version of Whole Foods Market in Silver Lake. According to LA Eater, customers will have the option of a dine-in experience as well as eating within the Whole Foods market area plus takeout. So it seems Silver Lake's really getting in on the vegan act as Moby's restaurant Little Pine is not too far away. Fantastic. Musician Hayley Williams from the band Paramore is launching a new hair dye and it's vegan, reports Bustle. The brand, which is called Good Dye Young, and that's D-Y-E, again, another fabulous play on words. Good Dye Young has been in the works for the past four years and is Williams' first business outside her band. And if the pictures are anything to go by, the brand will offer vegans the chance to dye their hair all kinds of bright colours. <laughs> Williams is pictured on Instagram with vibrant yellow hair. It's really lovely to see young entrepreneurs starting conscious and cruelty-free businesses. So all the best to Hayley for, for her new business. And finally, vegan fashion shoe and accessory brands took over Milan Fashion Week this month. A special event called The Ethical Code, created by Stefania de Pepe, played host to vegan and sustainable products, reports Vilda magazine. Designers included Ugo Massini and Tiziano Guardini, along with shoe brands Opificio V and Zet, the house brand of Australian shoe store Vegan Style. 
The event also showcased Origine luxury handbags and liquid flora makeup, all topped off with delicious canapes by vegan chef Lisa Bonzato. So this was a truly sustainable and ethical event, which just goes to show that fashion can be socially conscious as well as absolutely fabulous. And I really hope we'll be seeing more and more of this. So that's it for this episode of Vegan Business Talk. Thank you so much for tuning in. If you enjoyed the show, please consider giving it a review and a rating on iTunes or any other platform you're listening on. I'm Katrina Fox from veganbusinessmedia.com and I look forward to catching up with you in the next episode. Bye for now.